So our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Gronewald, Associate Professor at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability, PE. He holds adjunct faculty appointments at the University of Michigan's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. Dr. Grunwald conducts research through a range of hydrological science projects that explore methods for quantifying and communicating uncertainties arising within long-term hydrological monitoring networks and data, and incorporating these, those uncertainties into models and risk-based water resource management decisions. His recent research has focused on monitoring, analyzing, and forecasting the long-term water budget and water levels of the Great Lakes. All right, can everybody hear me okay through the microphone here? All right, because I am going to wander around. So, John, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and thank you all for coming back from lunch to listen to this talk. Uh, it's been really enjoyable so far, and I think what this organization is doing is just absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to start off here with uh, what I find to be a compelling image of Lake Ontario to get things started. It's not only a beautiful image of the lake, but it captures a lot of the hydrological and meteorological processes that make this such a wonderful place to live but such a challenging place to represent in computer models to forecast water level and hydrologic conditions. So for example, we have snowfall and snowpack across the region here. At some point that's going to melt and propagate into water levels. We have ice forming and retreating all up and down the St. Lawrence Seaway that affects the implementation of Plan 2014. And we have water vapor and clouds leaving the lake through evaporation. All these processes together affect what happens here on Lake Ontario. But the final point to make with this compelling image is that this is part of a bottleneck of the most massive lake system on Earth. And so the notion of trying to control the amount of water that flows through the system, let alone understand that amount of water, is a daunting task. So again, my name is Drew Grunewald from the University of Michigan. Um, thanks again, and I'm going to start off with giving just a few contextual points about the Great Lakes that I think are relevant regarding its magnitude, not just from a continental scale, but from a global perspective as well. I then want to dive in to take a look at our wonderful historical water level record across the Great Lakes, across a few different time scales. I then want to talk about our understanding of what I call the water balance or the water budget the amount of water that flows into the Great Lakes, how much of that turns into water level increases or decreases, and then the amount of water that leaves the system. So the overall water balance of the Great Lakes. I then want to make just a couple of notes. I don't have enough time to get too much into models, computer models, and forecasting, but I want to make a few points about the science of developing model forecasts for this region and the challenges we face. And then I want to leave you with two final thoughts, one of them political and one of them scientific. So before I go any further, I do need to thank uh, a lot of folks, not just um, you folks, Save the River and John, for the invitation to be here. But when I worked for NOAA at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I had an extraordinary team of scientists, students, and staff who helped me. And, and these are many of the folks that I worked with directly on the Great Lakes water level story. So I, a huge thanks to them. Uh, without them, the, the plots and the data sets that you see would not have been possible. And at the University of Michigan, here is my current team, again, of postdoc students um, and research scientists. I'm truly blessed to have such talented colleagues to help with this research. So I want to start off with the narrative here, with looking at the magnitude of the Great Lakes. And I've started off here with a table that ranks the largest lakes on Earth by surface area. So in the left-hand column here, you see the name of each one of those lakes. And it may not surprise you, for these long-term hydrological studies, we combine Lake Michigan and Lake Huron into one big lake, because on monthly and annual timescales, they effectively have the same water level. So here in the first column, I have the name of the lakes. In the second column, the country or the countries that those lakes reside in. And then we have surface area in both square kilometers and square miles, and then volume. 
When I highlight the lakes that constitute the Great Lakes, we see some interesting patterns. The first of which is that when it comes to collective surface area, nothing on Earth really comes close. Lake Superior alone right here, 82,000 square kilometers, is the largest single lake on Earth, and Lake Victoria is not that far behind. But Lake Victoria isn't part of the same type of lake system that all the Great Lakes are. So when you put all the Great Lakes together, we have this massive surface area, nothing else comes close. And that's important because two of the primary drivers of the water balance, over lake precipitation and over lake evaporation, take place over these massive surfaces. They're hard to represent in models, they're hard to monitor in real time. Now another point I make when we show this slide has to do with the volume of water. And earlier we heard that the Great Lakes represent about 20% of all Earth's fresh and frozen surface water, which is true. I also like to point out that the Great Lakes as a system, Lake Baikal and Lake Tanganyika, those three lakes or lake systems contain about half of all the Earth's fresh surface water. But finally, the point I've been making more recently is this one. There are 100 million lakes distributed across the Earth. And virtually all of the fresh, unfrozen surface water is stored in those lakes. So if you look at rivers, as valuable as they are, they don't store water the way lakes do, okay? So 100 million lakes on Earth with virtually all the fre Earth's fresh, unfrozen surface water. The top 10 largest lakes on Earth contain 80% of that water. So again, 100 million lakes on Earth, 10 of those, the top 10, contain 80% of the water. So there are a lot of really good reasons to understand how water flows through the Great Lakes and how it impacts Lake Ontario water levels and shoreline property. But I find in addition to that, one of the compelling reasons to understand the Great Lakes is from a global perspective. Because if we can understand how water passes through all of the lakes on Earth, and particularly the 10 largest ones, we're accounting for pretty much all of the Earth's fresh surface water. And that's something that motivates a lot of the research I'm doing these days. So I'm guessing most everyone is familiar with water flowing through the Great Lakes system, but just to make sure we're on the same page, here's a schematic that I often use to show uh, the watershed and, um, and the lakes themselves. So this tan area is the boundary of the Great Lakes Basin. And of course, water starts up in the headwaters of Lake Superior's watershed, flows from Lake Superior down through Lake Huron. Water from Lake Michigan interchanges through the Straits of Mackinac with Lake Huron, down through the St. Clair River, St. Clair River, Detroit River, over Niagara Falls, here into Lake Ontario, and then out through the St. Lawrence Seaway. A couple of key points on here that I've noted are, um, in addition to water flowing through the basin, there are also some interbasin diversions. Uh, some that get a lot of attention and some that don't. Two that don't often get a lot of attention are the Ugoki and the Long Lake diversions. These two are diversions of water that were set up decades ago to transfer water from Hudson Bay into the Great Lakes Basin. Why? Trade is a good guess, to increase hydropower capacity on the St. Mary's River, on the St. Mary's River. There's another diversion, of course, in Chicago to send water out of the Great Lakes system through the Illinois and the Mississippi River, and that was in, set up in the early 1900s to mitigate water quality problems. Two take-home messages about these diversions. The first is that despite the controversy of the Chicago River and its potential explanation for water loss, more water comes into the Great Lakes through these two diversions in the north than leaves in the south through Lake Michigan. Point number one. Point number two is that the long-term impacts of these diversions on water levels relative to the other type of fluctuations we see with precipitation evaporation are inconsequential. They're really just a matter of uh, inches over decades rather than meters over the course of just a few years that we see in response to precipitation and evaporation. So let's take a look uh, back at water levels uh, on a few different time scales as a basis for discussion, questions, and even conversation later today. So the story with the water levels really begins with a massive water level monitoring network across the Great Lakes made up of stations that look like this one. This is the water level gauging station on Mackinac City. There are 53 stations like this one across the US side of the Great Lakes, and those are represented in this image by blue dots. And there are about half that many on the Canadian side of the border. And together we call that the Great Lakes Water Level Monitoring Network. And I'll pause here for a second to point out that this record goes back with direct measurements all the way to 1860. 
with continuous measurements. There's really no large-scale system on Earth, water system on Earth, whether it's marine or freshwater, that has such a long and continuous, uninterrupted record of, of water levels or any component of the hydrologic system. We're truly blessed to have this record. So we can look at this record on a variety of different time scales. I want to start off first by looking at very short-term time scales. Um, the point being that w as water levels fluctuate up and down over the course of years, the impacts of those water levels can be exacerbated by very, very short-term events. So what I'm looking at here, I have two panels. On the top panel, I have surface water elevation here on the left in meters relative to the International Great Lakes datum of 1985. So these elevations are for our Great Lakes gauges. Don't worry, there's no data shown yet. I haven't put it up. We're just walking through the axes <laughs> for those adjusting your glasses. And then on this bottom panel, I have sea level. And you can see we're up here around 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to show a gauge there from Battery Park, New York City, for comparison. Um, the range of elevation in both plots is the same, so we're going to be comparing apples to apples in terms of variability. And then the time period I've chosen, for those of you who can see down in the bottom on the x-axis here, we're looking at the end of October 2012 and the beginning of November 2012. Why did I choose this time period? What major event was taking over the northeastern United States at that time period? You got it. Hurricane Sandy. So it got a lot of attention on the marine coasts. But I want you to take a close look at both the counterclockwise rotation of the hurricane and then also what might be the effects of this hurricane on wind and wave dynamics on the Great Lakes that a coastal homeowner might be concerned about. Let's take a look. So here I've shaded in that period of Hurricane Sandy on this timeline. And I want to point out the location of the two gauges that I'm going to be using here. For those of you who can see, Right here, I'm going to use the Fort Gratiot gauge, which is at the southern end of Lake Huron. That's the first gauge I'm going to show. And then I'm going to also use the data from the Buffalo water level gauge. So back to our plot. First, I'm going to add in data from the Fort Gratiot gauge. Those are hourly water level measurements across this time period. And then I'm also going to add in the Buffalo water level gauge. And then finally, for reference, I'll add in the water level gauge during that same time period from what was happening in the epicenter of New York City before, during, and after Hurricane Sandy. So certainly some interesting patterns here. A couple I want to point out. The first is that while we see this big rise in water levels in New York City, we also see a rise here on the southern end of Lake Huron. Water levels went up by almost two meters on the southern end of Lake Huron because of that counterclockwise wind activity. What I find compelling is that most of the water that would have stacked up there was actually ripping through the St. Clair River. So had the St. Clair River not been there as an outlet, we would have had war, more water stack up there and more flooding, underscoring how this type of event can really impact coastal water levels. Now you can see there's not too much of an impact on Lake Erie during the storm itself, but what do we see over here? What are these spikes? These are wind events. These are seiche events, right? These are meteorological events, wind coming across the lakes and literally causing the lakes to slosh back and forth. It happens on Lake Ontario. It happens on Lake Erie, in part because of their east-west orientation. But it happens on the other lakes as well. The take-home point is that not only are these spikes on about the same order of magnitude as the regular tidal variability on the marine coasts, but they are much, much harder to predict. Okay, so they take marinas by surprise, they take swimmers by surprise, they take homeowners by surprise. That's important when we're talking about coastal resilience. Now let's stretch out our timeline here. This is a look at the water level record, the entire water level record for the entire Great Lakes going all the way back to 1860. So I recognize the font size is a little bit small, but on the left-hand axis we hear, over here we have water elevations. Even if you can't read the numbers, they're all scaled the same. So we're comparing apples to apples of the different lakes. On the bottom axis down here, we're looking at years going all the way back. That's 1860 all the way up to present. And so for each lake, at the top here, I have Lake Superior water levels, then Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. This time series right here is Lake Erie, and then here is Lake Ontario. And for each lake, I have three data sets. The light blue dots are monthly water levels, the dark blue dots that you might not be able to see in the back, I'm sorry about that, are annual water levels. And then the red line going across there is the long-term average. So we could sit over this uh, with beers and talk about different patterns for an awful long time. A few time periods I want to underscore. The first, early 1920s. 
Why do I pull up the 1920s? Because this is the first time that implicit, explicit anthropogenic controls were put on the lakes at the outlet of Lake Superior. So we call these the compensating works, were installed at the outlet of Lake Superior. They don't do much to control Lake Superior, but nonetheless, they were put in place. And then a lot going on in the early 1960s, around this time period, record low water levels across the system, and also the beginning of the construction of the Moses Saunders Dam and the first real regulation on outflows for Lake Ontario. And of course, everyone in this room, most crowds that I talk to don't immediately notice this, but I guess most everyone here is noticing right away the change in the interannual variability on Lake Ontario water levels during this period before the 1960s compared to the period afterwards. Of course, a consequence of the regulation on Lake Ontario outflows. I then want to point out high water levels here in the mid-1980s, a period when houses were falling in the water. There was extensive erosion. Sounds familiar. During that time period, if you look at the reports, there were calls by the public for two things to happen to mitigate the impacts of high water levels across the entire system. One was to increase the rate of dredging operations through the system to cause water levels to go down. And the other one was to send more water out through the Chicago Sanitarian Shipping Canal. Interesting that those were the two things in 1960 that we were trying to compensate for and raise water levels. So different stories depending on whether water levels are high or low. Then we have the period from 1998 through 2013. For the upper Great Lakes, for Michigan, Huron, and Superior, this was almost a crisis. Lake Michigan and Lake Huron were very concerned about low water levels. Water levels hit record lows on Lake Michigan and Huron in January 2013. For this entire period of record, they had never been lower than January 2013. And there was a combination of a media, political, and science crisis exacerbated by images like this one. So a lobbying group put this image together as a potential explanation for where all the water was going during that time period. It's a big drain superimposed on Lake Huron. Um, and the, the challenge that this image created was it seemed to imply that there was really no scientific explanation for where the water was going, right? It could be dredging, it could be, uh, you know, evaporation, but we really don't know. And the answer is we did know. But there was just a lack of communication between the general public, the scientific community, the political community. And so part of what we work on is trying to tie those communities together. We did publish a lot of work in the, during this time period. We got it out there. Compensation measures that were proposed, including flaps in the bottom of the St. Clair and Detroit rivers to compensate for low water levels, were never put in place. Why? Because water levels surged. Starting in 2014, water levels embarked on a record-setting surge, setting the stage for where we all are now, whether you're on Lake Ontario or Erie or Michigan, Huron or Superior, we're right at record high water levels again. We published a lot of research on this, including this article that came out in 2015. In March of 2015, this was the cover article on EOS. It's the primary outlet for the American Geophysical Union. It's the, um, it's the largest physical science organization in the country. Um, and this was the article we published on the cover, sort of showing the iconic Chicago skyline here in the background, and then water crashing over the equally iconic bike path that's part of Chicago just two years after there were grave concerns over about low water levels and how to artificially raise them. Really compelling uh, discrepancy in those two narratives. So next, let's talk about what's behind these water level uh, differences over different time scales. And I want to start off first by making sure we all have a clear understanding of the long-term water balance or the water budget of the Great Lakes. So to do so, I want to look not just at a carve-out of the entire Great Lakes Basin, which is what this line shows right here, but I want to divide it up into the watersheds of the basins of each of the individual lakes. So here's the Lake Superior Basin all the way down to the Lake Ontario Basin. I am going to combine Lake Michigan and Lake Huron in the data I'm about to show you. So here on the left, we have a map where I want to show the three major components of the water balance, period. The three major components of the water balance. What they are is you might not be able to read this, but on the top here, there's a green dot that's going to represent, and I, again, I'm not showing you data yet. You're not missing anything. It'll be up there in a second. The green represents runoff. All the rivers and streams that come into each of the lakes, that's component number one. Component number two is going to be over lake precipitation represented by blue. That's all the precipitation that falls directly on the surface of the lake. 
And then in pink, I'm going to represent over lake evaporation. Again, one of the take home messages here is that there's really no other large freshwater system on Earth where hydrologists have to account for these three components. Most of my colleagues, they worry about runoff. They worry about snow, accumulating, melting, soil moisture. They take care of runoff, they're done. Very few hydrologists have to deal with these other two components, precipitation falling on a water surface and evaporation leaving a water surface as major components of the overall water balance. We're just unique in that way. So when we look at the numbers for this, even if you can't see the numbers, I want those of you around the room to see these vertical bars. All around, they're drawn on the same scale. So for example, here for Lake Superior, this green bar right there, that's the amount of runoff that comes in on average to Lake Superior. The blue bar is the amount of water that comes in directly through precipitation on the lake. So let's pause there for a second. The amount of water on average that comes into Lake Superior through precipitation on the lake surface is more than comes in through all the rivers, extreme, rivers and streams. That's extraordinary. So here's a question. How do you go about monitoring and understanding how much precipitation falls on Lake Superior? Do you, do you hang out there with a rain gauge? Well, we can get into the science of that, but the point is that it's complex and very few other hydrological models and hydrological systems have to deal with that. And the same is true with over lake evaporation. So these numbers here, for those of you who can see them, there are numbers here that say 1.6, 2.0, and 1.4. Those are thousands of cubic meters per second of flow. We've converted these into a flow rate. Um, so for example, on average, 2,000 cubic meters per second of water come into Lake Superior through precipitation. Now I want to jump ahead to the next part of the story. That's how much water is within each one of those basins for each of the lakes. But of course, another part of the story is how water transfers from lake to lake through the connecting channels. And that's what's on the right hand side here. So for example, these are all drawn to scale. So this vertical bar right here, even if you can't see the number, you can compare that magnitude to the ones on the left. That's the magnitude of water that flows out of Lake Superior into Lake Huron. As we work our way down through the system, this vertical bar here is the one I'm guessing a lot of people in the room are concerned about. That vertical bar right there at the top, it says 7.0. So that means on average, 7,000 cubic meters per second of water on average flow right outside of us by, uh, down the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence Seaway. Okay, a couple take home messages here about this. 7,000 cubic meters per second, that's a lot of water. So. So Niagara Falls is right here. So the water is cascading through the system. So this bar I'm circling right there, that's the St. Mary's River. These two right here are the water flowing through the St. Clair and Detroit rivers. And this right here is the water that comes in through Niagara Falls. And so the number at the top of that bar is 6.3. In other words, 6,300 cubic meters per second of water on average coming in to the Niagara River and on average 7,000 cubic meters per second going out. So the additional water that comes in is from Lake Ontario's internal watershed, right? 6.3 coming in, a net amount of water from the Lake Ontario watershed leading to 7,000 going out. Take home point. By the time that water combines with water from the Ottawa River and it reaches the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we're looking at about 16,000 cubic meters per second of water. And guess what? That's pretty much almost exactly the same as the annual average flow rate of the Mississippi River. Very few hydrologists and sciences, scientists I've talked to realize that or appreciate that. So the two major continental drainage systems off of North America, Mississippi River and Great Lakes St. Lawrence system. Awful lot of water we're talking about here. Okay, now let's put this into a longer context and I recognize you probably can't see all the letters on here, but the general takeaway of the graphic is still the same. I showed you earlier long-term water levels. Now I'm superimposing onto this long-term changes in the water balance to see the relationship, okay? So in this plot, again, on the bottom axis here, 1860 all the way to near present, just like the other one, this axis on the left is water elevations, just like I had earlier, but on the right, the numbers relate to annual precipitation values. So again, even if you can't see all the numbers, see if you can squint, these orange bars and green bars represent annual precipitation amounts. 
And I've drawn these to be consistent with sort of the way climate science is portraying numbers these days, where you have sort of an imaginary line going through there as it's the average precipitation. An orange bar is a precipitation year that is below average. And a green bar is a precipitation year that is above average. So take a squint there and tell me what you see going on across the entire Great Lakes system. A lot of precipitation, right? Not just here in Lake Ontario, but across the entire system over Earth's largest system of lakes, precipitation has been consistently going up. That is entirely consistent with climate change. That's what climate change projections have been saying for decades. It's consistent with the idea of warmer air with more moisture coming into the system. But regardless, this is empirical evidence. Okay? This is based on measurements. The second thing that you'll see is that over much of this period of record, water level variability could be tied pretty closely to precipitation variability. That is, big years where there was abundant precipitation, water levels went up. When precipitation went down, water levels went down. I don't know if you can all see it in this room, but if you look real hard, do you see this water level decline right there on Michigan-Huron and also on Erie? Those did not coincide with declines in precipitation. I'm going to advance one slide one more, and instead of showing you precipitation on top of water levels, I'm going to show you evaporation. And again, if you squint, you can see here, the red bars are years where there's above average evaporation, and the green where there's below average evaporation. And the take home message is that in the late 1990s, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron surface temperatures went up and stayed up by two degrees Celsius. For water bodies that big to jump up on average by two degrees Celsius represents an extraordinary amount of solar energy coming into the system. And the biggest explanation for that low period of water levels was this increased evaporation. It was not a drain in the bottom of Lake Huron. It was also not dredging activity or diversions out through the Chicago Sanitary and Shipping Canal. Okay, it was abundant evaporation. So let's take a look at a different time scale. Let's look at a seasonal water level surge. And in this case, we're gonna break down the 2017 surge in Lake Ontario's water level using this water balance data to show how we go about explaining from a science perspective what contributes to a water level rise or a water level decrease. So in this upper part of the plot here, I have sort of a, 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 a truncated view of the Great Lakes, but it's focused on Lake Ontario. So right here, here's Lake Ontario, and here's Lake Ontario's watershed. I've added in, even though it's not part of the water balance accounting I'm gonna do right now, here's the Ottawa River watershed coming down near Montreal. And then all of the rest of the Great Lakes, the upper Great Lakes, we're going to represent their outlet as a single point, as an input to the system through the Niagara River. So what I have on the upper right here is a table. And even if you can't read it in the back, I'm going to explain to you what it's showing. We're going to look at the total amount of water coming into this system in 2017 from January through June. And we're going to look specifically at what happened in 2017, and we're going to compare it to the long-term average of water coming into and leaving the system over that time period for a water balance accounting exercise. So the first thing we're gonna look at here is the amount of water coming in through the Niagara River. So even if you can't see it, what this row up here shows is inflow from Lake Erie through the Niagara River. On average, the total amount of water, if we convert all that water to meters on the surface of Lake Ontario, on average from January through June, the Niagara River contributes about 5.2 meters of water. It doesn't all stack up at once, of course, but we're just going to do some accounting here. So 5.2 meters of water coming in. In 2017, it was 5.7 meters of water. So right there, there is an explanation over that entire time period for about an additional half a meter, water, a meter of water that came into Lake Ontario during that time period. For each one of these records, if you look in the bottom left, again, even if you can't see all the letters in there, what I'm showing in this plot is on the bottom axis, we're going from January through June, okay? And every single light blue line is one of the January through June sequences of Niagara River flow in the historical record. The dark blue line that you see is what happened in 2017 for comparison. So again, every single Niagara River flow from January through June in light blue lines here, 2017 is the dark blue line for comparison. So, consistently above average flow, but not enough to explain everything that happened, right? That's not extraordinary. It's just six months in a row of above average inflow through the Niagara River. So next, 
let's look at what's happening within the Lake Ontario Basin itself. So here is Lake Ontario, its basin, and two data records that I want to show, and I know this is a little bit small, but let me point it out to you. Two things here. The first is the total amount of runoff coming into Lake Ontario during that time period. On average, you get about 1.2 meters of water that come into Lake Ontario from January through June from runoff alone. In 2017, it was 1.7 meters. So here we have a half a meter of additional water coming in from the Niagara River, above and beyond average, and a half a meter of additional water coming in from Lake Ontario's watershed. That's a lot. And a lot of that was attributed to the snow, the freshet, and the melt-off during that time period. This time series, for those of you who can see it on the bottom, shows every single January through June cycle of runoff coming into Lake Ontario. Look at what happened in 2017. Not only do we have a pretty high peak, but it came much later in the year than it typically does otherwise. Now, it's worth noting that this top panel right here may not be too discernible to everybody, but that's showing precipitation on Lake Ontario. And in fact, there was so much rainfall in May that year. You see that black point right there? It set a record for the total amount of precipitation on the lake in May of 2017. That contributed an extra two-tenths of a meter to the story. As I work my way through the table, for those of you who can't see, the next line is evaporation. There was effectively no change in evaporation during that time period. Neither below, neither below average or above average evaporation contributed to this story. Getting down the home stretch here, here's the big one. This is a chronology of average flows out through the St. Lawrence River throughout recorded history from January through June. Every light blue line represents a sequence from the historical record. Earlier in this time period, this is when a lot of folks probably say we could have tried to let more water out through the St. Lawrence Seaway had we known what was coming. But as you can see, flows during that time period are around average. It was only in May and June that flows were allowed to increase under the 2014 regulation, Plan 2014. And part of that, of course, has to do with what was happening downstream. So this last panel that I'm showing in the upper right here are flows coming into the system through the Otto River. These are not part of the water balance table that I'm setting up, but they're certainly the context for the abundant amount of water that was coming in. So even if you can't read the numbers here, these blue lines are every single historical spring on the Ottawa River. And this vertical axis right here is, I've converted it to cubic meters per second. So this is 2,000, 4,000, and 6,000. Remember the numbers I was showing you earlier about the amount of water that comes in through the Niagara River or typically leaves the St. Lawrence Seaway at around 7,000 cubic meters per second? In the spring of 2017, there were back-to-back -back months of Ottawa River flow of about, about 6,000 cubic meters per second. That's just an extraordinary amount of water that flooded out Montreal, and there was essentially nowhere for the water to go. So we put all this together. This is a comprehensive look at the entire water balance during that time period, and also a table here that summarizes how we can explain changes in water level over that time period. So as I wrap up here, I want to make a couple of notes about forecasting and the science of looking ahead two, three, or four months to try to understand what might happen with the water balance and how that might change what happens with water levels. And so I chose this image. It includes not just Lake Ontario, like my first slide, but the entire Great Lakes system. Again, looking at all the complex processes that we want to try to represent with the water balance. Snow on the land surface, but heterogeneous, heterogeneous right? Canadian systems of monitoring might have a lot of snow on the ground, but US systems might not. We have to put those together to understand the system. We have different rates of evaporation across the Great Lakes. Here's the key point. We actually have computer models that can represent this process pretty well. We can simulate evaporation in a model. We can put precipitation on the ground. But the big problem is this. Those processes within the Great Lakes, the amount of precipitation, the amount of ice that forms, depend on major air masses that are moving around the North American continent that are bringing air of different temperatures into the system and water with different amounts of moisture into the system. In order to predict what's going to happen in Lake Ontario three months from now, you have to be able to predict what's going to happen with these air masses right here. So for example, we've got in the, in the top part of the plot here, the continental Arctic and continental polar air masses, very, very dry, very, very cold air.
What happens when one of those air masses wobbles over the Great Lakes? It's an Arctic polar vortex deformation. The lakes freeze, evaporation rates go down. Can we predict when that happens? No. No. We can make general statements about the frequency that that might happen over a 20 or 30 year period, but none of these Arctic polar vortex deformations we've seen in the past decade were predicted three months in advance. Yet they have profound impacts on the hydrologic cycle. The same is true with air masses that carry moisture. These maritime polar air masses, cold, moist air, they also converge on the Great Lakes periodically and bring a lot of rain, as do the maritime tropical air masses here and in the bottom right. The maritime tropical air mass here most often makes its way up through the Gulf of Mexico, carrying a lot of moisture to the Great Lakes. So the challenge, in part, is being able to have global and continental scale models that pre can predict how these air masses are going to move across the country and how they're impacted by the polar jet stream, which, wouldn't you know, cuts right across the Great Lakes. Sometimes wobbles above the Great Lakes and sometimes wobbles below. But that's the challenge we face. This slide underscores just how that variability coincides. You probably can't see. I'll outline in red here. Here's an outline of the United States on this map. And this is actually a pressure map showing a, uh, an air pocket of extremely low pressure just off of Lake Michigan. These are the Great Lakes right here. But the take home message is that these huge air masses uh, can move around in subtle ways. And if there's a prediction for one of them to come across the Great Lakes and it's wrong, we have a completely different hydrologic response and change in water levels than if it were the other way around. So two final thoughts for you. Again, one of them a little bit political and one of them more fun and scientific. The first is that I know there are a lot of folks in the room who are interested in the role of the IJC and in binational water agreements. I think one of the biggest problems facing this community, whether it's here in the room or whether it's across the entire Great Lakes, is the ability to pull together the state of the art in binational monitoring and model systems. Let me tell you why I think that. This map on the screen right here overlays two different important boundaries. One boundary is the Great Lakes Basin. The other boundary is the way NOAA, the agency I used to work for, divides up its state-of-the-art river forecasting systems. So those are divided up into these big colored blobs here on the bottom. Three different river forecasting centers have to come together just to understand the U.S. side of the Great Lakes, but there's no single entity within NOAA, one of the leading meteorological and hydrological forecasting agencies in the world that covers the entire Great Lakes system. That's a problem. What does that mean? It means that last February in 2019, right before record-setting flooding on Lake Ontario, we had a soil moisture map that looked like this. Even if you can't see the numbers, guess what dark green means? <laughs> Not only does it mean a lot of moisture in the soil, the numbers that you see around there are percentiles, ranking the soil moisture in history. And even those in the back can't see this, the numbers all around those contours range between 95 and 99. Okay? The wettest conditions that we've ever seen in the recorded history are close to it for the upper Midwest and Great Lakes. What's one of the problems with this map? Where do those colors stop? right along the international border. So we've been arguing for years that these maps need to be continuous, especially to serve the Great Lakes community. The Canadian federal government does a better job of encompassing all this, but the United States federal government does not. Well, unfortunately, when you combine this information with a set of models that do not include at all the Great Lakes, let alone high water level conditions on the Great Lakes, you get a spring flood outlook that looks like this. Dark blue represents areas most prone to flooding potential, and the browns indicate really no flood potential. And take a look along the coastline here of Lake Ontario. In fact, the, the no threat zone continues right up along here past Watertown, all along the shore of Lake Erie. Record high water levels on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, but no threat of, flood for, of flooding in this particular outlook map. And that is a direct consequence of the fact that there is no binational system for forecasting water level conditions across this water body. That needs to be fixed. And because I no longer work for NOAA, I can actually encourage you to lobby <laughs> for that change. Um, so that's something, John, we should talk about later. But there, there are things in place 
Uh, my colleague Vincent Fortin and I, he's a Canadian hydrologist. He's probably the best hydrologist in Environment Climate Change Canada. Uh, really a brilliant guy. We hosted a workshop in, in 2011 to get people together from both agencies to solve this problem. And it was published, the results of the workshop were published in a paper. I'll read the title. It says exactly what we want to do. Advancing Great Lakes Hydrologic Science Through Targeted Binational Collaborative Research. Targeted, what are the problems we're trying to solve? We need better seasonal forecasts for this region and it needs to be done in a way that is truly binational. So uh, that's a paper that might be of interest to some of you. And then the final point I want to make has to do with some fun research. We were commissioned during the low water level period by the IJC, by Elena Pollock and others, to get a better understanding of all of these hydrological processes. When water levels were low, the process people were most concerned about was evaporation. So remember I talked before about standing out in the middle of the lake with a rain gauge? Well, imagine what you do with evaporation. How do you understand spatial heterogeneity and evaporation across Earth's largest lakes? What we did is we partnered with my colleague Peter Blanken at University of Colorado Boulder, John Lenters from Environment Climate Change Canada, and they were savvy enough to figure out how to install eddy covariance towers, or more simply evaporation stations, on old abandoned lighthouses across the Great Lakes. So this is the White Shoal Lighthouse. For any of you who either lived or passed through Michigan, it's one of the choices you can have for your license plate. Um, but actually, very few people have actually seen it. it. You can't see it from shore. It's way offshore in the northern part of Lake Michigan. One of our evaporation stations is on the top of this lighthouse. We like to joke that this would be a great place for a winter student internship. <laughs> We'd probably be violating several laws, including those put in place by OSHA. I've actually been at the top of this several times. The, the rails at the top of this come right above my knee. <laughs> Um, and there, there are handholds that you can hold on to, sort of like any lighthouse, but it's, it's scary and beautiful at the same time. The final message, and then John, this evolves a little bit of our conversation last night about the shipping industry. I'm a firm believer that for this problem to be solved, all the different parties involved need to be at the same table. Industry, research, property owners. I was having a beer with um, Mark Fisher from the Council of the Great Lakes Region in Chicago a few years ago. And he said, Drew, what can we do with our industry connections to help improve science on the Great Lakes? And I thought, this is one of those elevator moments, right? And I said, boy, it would be really great if we could install those evaporation stations on the ship, on the, on the commercial vessels. Because they push the boundary of their shipping season so much, they're going to get conditions that we won't be able to get on the boundary of the ice season. A few phone calls later, I was on the horn with Catherine Laboon, executive director of the Canadian Steamship Authority, and she said, that's a great idea. So I and my colleagues were able to install on the bow of the Whitefish Bay, one of the vessels that crisscrosses the Great Lakes. So I took this picture at a conference on the Detroit River as she was steaming by, and right on the bow of the mast right there is one of our eddy covariance systems. that's continuously recording information. We've been able to include that in, well, th really thank my colleague Peter Blanken, because he was the one who did most of this, but um, that information is being passed now into data sets and models to help us get a better understanding of evaporation and the overall water balance. So I'll leave you with this image of the Great Lakes to tie everything together, and I'll stop there. John, thank you again for the invitation, and thank you all for your attention. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, buddy.